Are you ready to turn your investments into retirement income? Listen in as Jeremy Kyle and his guests reveal ways you can make smarter retirement, investment, and tax planning decisions to achieve your ideal retirement. You will learn more about your money so you can feel better about your money and make better money decisions. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Retirement Revealed. I'm your host, Jeremy Kyle, and we're here to turn your retirement savings into retirement income. And today we're talking with two guests, Drew Ritchie and Sean Perry. They wrote a book together called Finding Your Financial Advisor. This is such a topic that everyone's looking to figure out is how do you find a financial advisor? So that's why I brought them on the show. Drew and Sean, thanks for coming to the show. Yeah, thanks so much yeah. for, for inviting us. <clears throat> Hey, you got it. And uh, of course, there's two of you here we're talking to, and you both wrote the book together. But I, I think the book is not your first time working together. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Yeah, Drew and I have been uh, business partners for more than 15 years. Drew started working with our team when he was in college. So uh, I won't date him, but we've, we've been working together for a long time. And we have a 11-person wealth management practice here in Bowling Green, Kentucky. That's great. Now, Bowling Green, remind me, that's where they make the Corvettes, right? That's right. That's, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, now, I'm just curious if you guys have a Corvette at all. <laughs> not me. It's not on my list. Not on your we list? Both, we both drive pickup trucks. so We're not huge car guys. And then we, you get down to, it's also cave country. We're close to Mammoth Cave. And that's right. It's one of those things where when you're from a place, you uh, you don't do all the things that people travel to and, and do when they get here. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about spring break, and uh, that might be our uh, our halfway point. Is to, it, like, it is for country. a lot of people. Yeah, that's yep. right. Oh, that's awesome. Good. We're not here to talk about Corvettes and spelunking, right? But we're here to talk about how to find your financial advisor. And of course, I love the tagline. You guys said how to understand the industry and confidently hire the best. Let's talk about that first one. How does someone who's not a financial advisor, uh, what's there about the financial advisor industry that they need to understand? Well, one of the major catalysts for the book, and it's been something that Sean and I have talked about for years, is that there's not a standard curriculum or program for becoming a financial advisor like there is in so many industries. And we talk about that in the book. You you can be confident that if you have an attorney, that attorney has gone through law school, they've passed a bar exam, they've met their state board requirements, the same with a certified public accountant, a CPA, You you have credentials or industry standards that you know those professionals have been through in order to call themselves an attorney, a doctor, a CPA. But when it comes to advisors, Jeremy, that same standard doesn't exist. There are advisors that prepare taxes for folks in the springtime and, and put financial advisor on their business card and sell annuities. There's life insurance folks that have one product that call themselves financial advisors and everywhere in between. So we feel like it's complicated for folks, you know, and a lot of the portion of the book, the lens that I tried to view it through as we're, as we're writing was if my own mother were in this situation and she's trying to find an advisor, she's retired and needs somebody to help her. How would she go about it? What tools are out there for her? And other than a few blog posts here and there, or an article scattered out, most folks just talk to their friends talk to a family member, talk to a coworker that may or may not have a good one, may or may not have a good experience or much education on it. And we felt like we wanted to help provide some standards that people could go by as they began that process. Yeah. Specifically yeah. because of what most people are usually going through during the process of finding a financial advisor. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Well, I was going to say, also, it, it seems like this is one of those things for 10 years we talked about, you know, we'd be in a meeting with a prospect and they would say, well, how do we know what we should be looking for? How do we compare you to someone else? And like most ideas, it took a long time of it, us being beat over the head with it before we finally did something with it. But we found that people tend to be in transition when they're looking for someone, whether it's death of a spouse, changing jobs, there's a lot of other things that come into that. So that certainly retirement, retirement, there's transitions, there's trigger points that allow people to start looking for an advisor. Yeah. They get to a point where whatever advice they've had in the past, they know now I need something else. So they're already anxious, uncertain, insecure, likely emotional. And now they try to hire an advisor and they usually don't take enough time to go through the process that 
that we advocate for. Yeah, thanks for mentioning the emotional part of it because uh, there's a lot of emotions around transitions. You might be retiring and it might not have been your choice or you find out that the way retirement's playing out for you is different than how you expected it to be. And of course, some of those uh, transitions are, I mean, huge. Not that retirement's a minor transition, but some are you know, crazy huge, like a divorce or becoming widowed, uh, things like that. So I think you're right on to almost prepare. Like, don't expect there are going to be transitions. Like, things are going to change in your life, and it's it's nicer to have somebody you already trust and you you have met them and kind of vetted them in a a calm, cool, collected kind of process ahead of time, as opposed to trying to make that decision in an emotional state or maybe even a a time deadline. Yeah, I get people all the time. We do a, a good amount of work with people that are making decisions on their pension. And sometimes you get this piece of paper that says 60 days from now, you better have your signature on here and here's how you're gonna take your pension. That's gonna be that way for the rest of your life and you can't make a change ever. I mean, that's that's a really quick time frame. And your course, spouse's signature and a right. notary and yep. all these other things, yeah. What's funny too, at least at, even with the 60 days, I'm thinking of a couple folks, they call us because they say, hey, I got this thing like two months ago and it's due tomorrow and we need to make a decision here real quick. And you know, that's a that's a tough turnaround time to uh, say, we got to make this decision by tomorrow. So good for you for putting a book out there and helping people make these decisions about who's going to be the one helping them through a transition ahead of time. And of course, if somebody's helping you through, you can't just delegate or abdicate all the responsibility to them. Uh, the first part of your book where you you talk about take ownership of your own financial circumstances. It's not like you say, I got an advisor, so I don't have to worry about anything. T tell us a bit about that. Well, first off, we wanted to just kind of set the stage for what's at stake in your retirement, the pitfalls of investing that we see, and really kind of tee it up for why people need an advisor in the first place. Jeremy, you and I, and and of course, Sean, know these timeless principles of investing and concepts around you know the risks of being out of the market when it goes up versus just staying in the whole time or the pitfalls of trying to time the market, what inflation is going to do to retirement plan over the first 20 years of their retirement. So the taking ownership section is, is more of a, it's not meant to scare anyone, but it's meant to say, hey, this is a big deal. You get one shot at navigating this transition that you're going through correctly, whatever that may be for folks. And here's why we advocate that you need some help first off. And that taking ownership may be not just doing it all yourself, but understanding why you need help. And then also understanding how to get the right kind of help that you need. So that's really what what how we start our book. You got it. Of course, the right kind of help is a section you talk about having the minimum standard and when I saw that tagline, I was wondering, okay, what, what type of basics of understanding do you need about what's going on with the financial services industry? And I think this is where it comes in. Like I said earlier, there's generally not much of a minimum standard to call yourself a financial advisor. And there's a whole lot of different ways people could just call themselves a financial advisor. Heck, they can call you a financial advisor. You can call yourself a financial advisor without meeting any of the standards. Like no one's really policing this, it seems like. A lot of times, what would you say are the, the minimum standards? What's kind of the minimum that you got to be looking for if you're trying to uh, hire your financial advisor? Unfortunately, that you know, you're correct. Like people just all they got to do is print a business card that says they're a financial advisor and they get to say that. Mm -hmm. So, in the book, we said there was five minimum standards, and those are education, a background check, what services are offered, the practice profile, how they're structured, and then what's the cost to doing business with those. I think the background check is one that a lot of people don't know about. They don't know that that's an easy way that they can check on someone and see where they're registered, how they're registered, if they have issues in their past. And a lot of people, you know, we even say in the book, like people have things that are on their record. It, they just need to be able to explain them. And there just needs to be transparency around the process. Right. Yeah. So, and we provide in our pre-meeting checklist and the hiring guide tool as a um, an asset that goes with our book, questions to ask around each of those. So in our minimum standards, we're not necessarily advocating for, and this is really important. I hope, I hope there are other advisors listening to this. This is not something where we're saying, here are what your minimum standards should be. What our book does is say, here's the the categories that you need to consider and you need to decide for yourself 
what education you're looking for, what what's important to you in a background check, what services you're looking for. So we're not saying here's the services that they need to be able to provide. Here's what their practice needs to look like at all. There's a lot of different ways that businesses can be structured and a lot of different ways people can attain financial services, but clients need to be empowered to understand what it is they're looking for in that. Yeah, I see a lot of stuff, especially online. It says you need a fee only advisor. You only should work with these type of folks. And I, I think that's that's a little dogmatic. The biggest example I, I like to put out is just, you know, if you need a Roth IRA and term life insurance, just about any financial advisor could help you out that way. And oftentimes, actually, if you follow kind of the advice of you need a financial uh, an hourly financial advisor or a fee only advisor, some of them might not even be able to help you out with that. And so it's kind of understanding first what you actually need before you go look for it. Uh, it's going to, and so the opposite, like, oh, I have to work with this type of person. Well, what are you actually looking to solve for? That's the biggest thing to begin with. And then go look for that type of person that helps you solve those issues. Cost is the easiest example. We describe the different ways that people can pay financial advisors and who may fit each of those arrangements, fee for service, asset-based fee, transactional costs may be appropriate in some circumstances. So again, we're not saying here's how we do it and here's how it should be done. We're just saying, here's your options, which one's going to fit best for you, and then figure out the person you're interviewing, how they do it and see if that's a good fit. Yeah. And of course yeah, you get these different areas and that's the next step is to do interviews. And uh, what I found when people come in our office and they're interviewing us, they oftentimes have like 10 questions and they, they've got it written out, which is good. They've done the research, got it written out. They ask the first one, which is, are you a fiduciary? We answer the question as yes. And then they say, okay, great. And they fold up their questions and they put it back in their pocket. Like, hold, hold on a second. Like you, you took the time to research this. You have, you know, five, 10 questions. Don't just feel like you checked one box and you're you're done with it. I'm I'm sure you've got some suggested questions or or different ways you suggest going out and interviewing advisors. Tell us about that. Well, we approached it in the book of dividing it into our four core values of our team, which are wis- wisdom, discipline, transparency, and humility. So we use those four core values as how we broke up the questions and the process that people should go through regarding the interviews. For example, like Wisdom talks about specializations within the team. How do they coordinate with other professionals? What's their client education program? So we used our four core values as a, we thought that was a great way to break the concepts up and to talk about them inside the interview questions. But as Drew mentioned, Drew created a a hiring guide to go along with the book. So it's a download on our website that people can take with them a free download, a free download that they can take with them into an interview and actually score. So if they're meeting with different advisors, they can score different advisors and it gives them questions that they might ask that might generate more information. So that was a something when we started writing the book, I don't think we really thought this was going to be a deliverable, but through the process became one of the, one of the cool takeaways from it. That's great. How do you get that? You said it's a free download on, on your site. It's a free download. Anyone can access it on www.findingyourfinancialadvisor.com. Yeah, you just go in, put in your name and email address, and we send you automatically a copy of the hiring guide. So the hiring guide has a how to use section, five minimum standards, again, ranking those, uh, an advisor interview questionnaire template. So you can take ready-made 25 or 30 questions into the interview with you. So you're fully prepared. And then on the very back of that is a scoring guide. So you can rank how they stacked up for your minimum standards, your interview questions. And then last is a very important part of it. How did they make you feel? Did you feel? Yeah. They may check all the boxes, but if you didn't feel good, oftentimes our natural instincts tell us, uh, tell us what we need to know the most. So we want to make sure to mention that. A lot of times with a married couple, I find that the the female spouse has that gut feeling a lot of times better than the male does. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I hear you there. That's I found that too a few times where it seems like there's always a financial spouse and a non-financial spouse. And uh, sometimes it matches up with kind of the the typical gender stereotype that maybe it's the the male that's reaching out on uh, there. Sometimes it's just the male doesn't want to reach out because they, they feel as if uh, I don't want somebody else to tell me what to do. And it's kind of the, the female sometimes, you know, needle in, in the elbow, like, Hey, let's get this stuff done. Let's go talk to an expert. And these are big deals uh, that we got to 
go with. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind is that you might be the financial spouse. You might've been the one that interviewed all the different advisors, but you got to make sure that your non-financial spouse, whether it's your you know husband or wife, that they feel good about this person too. Because especially if it is, let's 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 go with some stereotypes here. Let's say it's the, the husband. He makes the choice. Well, guess what? Us guys die before the ladies. That's the averages. And so you might've been sticking your, your wife with an advisor they really didn't care for. And I think that's finding that dynamics of how does the advisor talk with both spouse, whether it's a male, female, kind of financial, non-financial, that's probably a good indication of how they relate to people and how much care they might take into your accounting, your planning. If they are dismissive, if they aren't including the other spouse and things, that, that's maybe an indication that they're not looking out for you together as much as they should. Mm-hmm. It's Jeremy Kyle here, and I know you're listening to the Retirement Reveal Podcast because you want to learn more about making great retirement decisions. I've created a free video course for you to do just that. Head over to 5stepretirementplan.com and sign up to receive this video training right in your email inbox. We broke down our five-step retirement plan into bite-sized videos so you can get started on the retirement, investment, and tax planning you need to create a consistent retirement income. Go to 5stepretirementplan.com Use the number or spell it out. You'll get there either way. Five step retirement plan.com. Thanks for listening. And now for the rest of the show. Yeah, good. Well, the last part after you've done the interviews and you've kind of decided what your own minimum standard might be is the decision making. You know, what if somebody's gone through, they found two or three good options? How do they make a choice? Well, we would advocate kind of going through that process of defining your minimum standards, conducting interviews. And we we would say, you know, take your time to go through this, try to do it before you're in that transition because you should interview two or three people, right? This is a huge decision. And even folks that come to us and say, we've read about your team or you've been referred by this group or, you know, we've written a book on this. So we haven't talked to anyone else. We'll say, take your time, go through this, have some conversations with some other folks, because how do you know that the first person that you're looking at or the first person whose name you got is that right fit for you? It's worth taking time. So go through those interviews, conduct two or three different ones, and then go through your post-meeting scorecard and kind of assign a a value to each of those subjects. There's not, other than the gut check of how did it make you feel or just having a comfort level and needing to move forward with someone, there's nothing we've found out there that can help you really, you know, score uh, how those conversations went and make a decision based on that. And there's so many different questions that that you really need to dig into during that process. I'll give you an example, Jeremy, and I'll let Sean add to this. Everybody's got a team now, right? So when we talk about a practice profile, most most folks would say, well, I'm looking for a team, not just one person. Because what happens when they retire? What happens when they're on vacation? What happens if the unfortunate event, something happens to them? So I'm looking for somebody with a team. Well, Jeremy, you and I know that not all teams are created equal. Right. And in the book, and this is why what this is why it's important for folks to read this book, because this is not intuitive. A lot of teams look more like a golf team than a basketball team when you get down to it. And by that, I mean, you've got a group of professionals that play separately and at the end of the day, just total their score. Right. Like a golf team, they're advisors that maybe cover for each other, but they don't have individual specializations. They don't have one centralized business like a basketball team where it takes everyone playing their role to accomplish the main goal. Right. It's totally different. There's even some that we've seen that will have home office, corporate, you know, employees listed on their team's website as members of their team. And, and we know that that's probably not what we're looking for. So yeah, that's a little bit of an aside from how you get to making your decision, but I'm trying to kind of tee up why it's so important to have understanding and ownership and why it's worth writing a book about, you know, this process took Sean and I the better part of a year and a half. And it's not because we want to send it to a couple dozen people in our area. It's because we want we want the 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 industry as a whole to benefit from the work we've done and the knowledge we have around it. And we think that it's information people need to hear. Well, better competition is good for everyone, right? The client ends up in a better situation. We're not dealing with these sort of crazy 
one-off advisor things that, that a lot of times we end up, a client comes back and says, this person said this or that. And this just gives a really good way of, I think, for people to separate the wheat from the chaff, a lot, the chaff a lot of times. So that's been good. We we said with, you know, the resources are, and Drew's talked about them, the pre-meeting checklist, the questionnaire, the post-meeting scorecard, that after going through all of that, then people ultimately will feel confident, comfortable, and connected. I mean, and that's really the goal for us is for people to to just have some confidence around the decisions that they're making. Yeah. And we, we've discounted our book, Jeremy, if we're, if we're wrapping up, I'll be happy to, to talk about that a little bit. We have donated a hundred percent of the proceeds from our book, not just profits, but proceeds from our book to local charities in our area. And we have, uh, for perpetuity discounted the book to 99 cents on Amazon again, because we want to get this message out, not because we're trying to make money. Sean and I are only authors in the aspect that we published this book, but we're financial advisors running a practice that we don't talk about in the book at all. It's not a sales pitch for us. It's to change the industry and what people expect. Yeah. Even yeah. we even said starting out, like we, if somebody in Des Moines, Iowa, could pick, you know, if their practice looks like what we described, they should be able to buy 20 of these and give them to clients and it should reinforce their practice. It doesn't have anything to do with us. And that was our hope across the country and, and, you know, could still happen this year. We're just now not even six months into the process. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And that's why I want to have you guys on the the show. I just thought the idea we we love education, we love giving. And that's what I think you guys did is you, or you're giving of your time to write this book to educate not just clients, but advisors. You know, if you're an advisor starting out and you're thinking, how should I maybe structure my practice uh, going through and maybe thinking on your own, like what type of minimum standards should I have and how should I answer these questions that people should be bringing to me on there? And of course, speaking about education and, and giving, we love giving away books uh, on our podcast. So the first three people that email us, it's podcast at kylefp.com. We'll send you out one of the books there. So the Finding Your Financial Advisor book. And of course, we'll have links to the book in our show notes as well too. Well, Drew and Sean, I got uh, one more question for for each of you. But before we get there, tell us where can people reach out to you? What's the best way for people to, to reach you? Yeah, Drew mentioned um, the book's website is findingyourfinancialadvisor.com. Our website for our practice is perryritchiegroup.com. Like I said, we're with Baird here in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Yeah, that's great. And uh, of course, if anyone wants to reach out to us, see what we're doing here with the Kyle Financial Partners, it's uh, retirement-reveal.com to check out the podcast and learn more about us. All right. Well, we got one more uh, question I'll have each of you guys. If you could just tell us something about yourself that few people know about. And remember, this podcast is rated clean. I'll start. So I'm into endurance sports. I like kind of doing crazy long distance stuff. And I'm currently training for the Leadville, Colorado, 100 mile mountain bike race next August in Leadville, Colorado, the highest city in North America. That is crazy. I drove once from Denver, kind of taking the back roads to um, Grand Junction area. And I made sure to go through Leadville and it's like walking around there is tough because it's like 11, 12,000 feet yeah, it's, up. It's no, just over 10,000 yeah. in the city. So yeah, yeah, and the mountain bike race takes you up close to 13. So oh my it's goodness. 105 miles through the, the Rocky Mountains. So yeah, awesome. that would be me. And for you, Drew, that's awesome. I once saw the same sunrise twice. All right. so I saw the sunrise in the same day twice. So I was on a mission trip to China. I was flying home from Seoul, Korea to Atlanta, getting boarding the plane in Seoul. I saw the sunrise and coming over Iowa, headed into Atlanta. I opened the window and saw the same sunrise. That's pretty cool. I like that. Now, I've heard people like they fly around the the whole world, like on New Year's Eve, like they can hit all. <laughs> I heard, I feel like I've heard that before. That's that's awesome. That's cool to see the sunrise. That's a much better deal than uh, you know trying to hit the every single New Year's party that's out there. <laughs> sounds less, sounds more clean. That's right. That's exactly it. I love it. Good, awesome. Well, well, thanks guys for coming on the show. This has been a huge help uh, for everyone and how they can find their their financial advisor. And just appreciate you taking the time to write the book and and come on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having it's us. It's our pleasure. Fun. Thank you. You got it. And thank you for listening to the Retirement Revealed podcast. We believe if you know more about your money, 
you will feel better about your money and you will make better money decisions. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Revealed podcast. Click on the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit retirement-revealed.com to learn more. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Kyle Financial Partners. Kyle Financial Partners does not provide legal, accounting, or tax advice. Consult your attorney or tax professional. Representatives have general knowledge of the Social Security tenants. For complete details on your situation, contact the Social Security Administration. Kyle Financial Partners is a part of the Thrivent Advisor Network, a registered investment advisor. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.